Hello, hello. It's time for Class B amplifiers. We're going to look at large signal analysis of a Class B configuration, which is going to solve some of the issues we had with Class A. So Class A, you might remember, current flows 360 degrees out of the cycle. Right? We have one transistor. These are all the circuits we've looked at up to now. Um, the problem with class A is the low efficiency. This is item number one. The, the maximum theoretical efficiency is only 25%. The other problem is current is always running through these things. In other words, if we did a, uh, a little DC AC load line kind of affair on this. All right, so here's your AC load line. You're biased out here with a Q point, hopefully right in the center. Even if you have no signal, you're still drawing this current. You're still drawing ICQ over here. No signal, and you're drawing current. Of course, you have a full power supply voltage, so that product gives you a power dissipation. That's not very efficient. It's kind of like having your car engine running at 6,000 RPM all the time, right? Just screaming. It would be more efficient if you only, you know, uh, drew current, in other words, dissipated power, when you needed it. Right? rather than having the thing just running full bore all the time. That's what class A is going to do for, or excuse me, that's what class B is going to do for us. It's going to solve this problem of the class A. So class B is defined as IC only flows 180 degrees. If you think about that for a second, that's half a cycle, so that implies we're going to need two transistors to get a full cycle of our input waveform. The upside of this is going to be Maximum theoretical efficiency is 78.5%. Um, and we can get this ver very close to this in lab. We can build little amplifiers with 75% you know, efficiency on that output stage. All right, so how do we do this? Well, it comes back to our load line. So here is our AC load line. Right here, PCE, IC. Now, as I said up here, if you have a, a Q point in the center, you can swing up and you can swing down. You get the full cycle. Now, what if we took the Q point and we brought it all the way down here to cut off? Right, so this is our uh, Q point. And we're now at VCE cutoff for a value here. Well, what you wind up being able to do is swing all the way up to saturation and then all the way back down. But of course, you're only going to get half the input cycle. So in the case of a uh, you know, simple MPN transistor, we're only going to get the positive half wave. Right? Well, that's not so good by itself. If we can get some kind of mirror image circuit to take care of the negative portion of the waveform, things might work out for us. But here's the really cool thing about this. If you stick the Q point right here, what you're saying is that ICQ is basically zero. If ICQ is zero, you're not drawing any power, right? I mean, in reality, there'll be some small leakages and, and there'll be some bias currents elsewhere. But your current draw is very small and therefore the power draw is very small, all right? When you have no signal. And then as you start to draw on this. In other words, as the signal comes up, we're starting to swing along this AC load line, and what ends up happening is we draw more current from the power source, and we start dissipating more power. But we only draw it when we need it. All right? And ultimately, we'll be able to swing, like I said, all the way up to AC, uh, IC sat and back. So this will, once again, will tell us uh, what the compliance of the amplifier is. It'll basically be whatever the cutoff voltage is. As a, as a peak value, because we can swing from there all the way up to saturation, which is, of course, zero volts for VCE. So whatever VCE cutoff works out to be, that'll be the peak compliance of our amplifier. All right, now how do we do that? How do we make a circuit that's biased this way? Well, um, you could, sort of our first attack at this, you could imagine doing something like this. If you had a DC uh, bias voltage on here, you know, what if you brought it to zero? In other words, what if you just brought this to ground? and you had a load resistor out here, like a, a voltage follower, right? So you could basically have the, the Q point on this thing, 
um, you know, right at zero. This is not at all a practical circuit, of course, because you have a dead short right on the front end, and if your input current's coming in, well, you know, it's going to get shunted directly to ground by this short rather than going into the transistor. All right, well, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to need two devices because the current's only going to flow for half the cycle. So what if we make a mirror image of this, a complement of this? What do we wind up with? Well, we would wind up with something that looks like this. So I've got an NPN over here. Put in this little biasing resistor. And I'm down, down here, I'm going to put in a PNP. And we'll run that down to a negative power supply. So this is a positive power, and this is negative power. And this will also have a biasing resistor. And I'll just connect these two together. Input signal will come in over here. And then my load eventually will be out here. Right? But right now, I just want to look at the DC. So what are we looking at? Well, first of all, I would make these two resistors the same size. All right? And ideally, transistor 1 and transistor 2 would have identical parameters. In other words, they'd have similar betas, similar um, maximum current, maximum voltage, power ratings, things like that, right? We would call those complementary pairs. You know, for example, in lab, we very often use a 2N3904 NPN transistor. The complement to that is the 2N3906, so very similar characteristics. Now what ends up happening is um, in the ideal case we would have half the total power supply across the transistor number one, half the total power supply across transistor number two. In other words, this connection point right here, I put a little dotted line here, that's basically sort of the line of symmetry. And if these two power supplies are symmetrical, which ordinarily they would be, in other words, like a plus and minus 25 volts, plus and minus 50 volts, something like that, um, we would see sort of the positive supply sitting across Q1 and the negative supply sitting across Q2. And this point right here, ideally, would be ground. Okay. Now, same thing would be true back here. So we would take our input signal coming in, we'd apply it to the two bases, as the input signal grew, we would start in the positive direction. We would be putting current into this base, and this transistor would start to um, conduct. So if we had a load out here, what we would see on a positive input, all right, so here's my input signal coming in over here. So here's the positive part of my input wave. This is going to be coming in like so. Notice that if you make this terminal here, this base positive, you're actually going to turn off Q2. So basically this thing opens up and you have a, uh, a simple voltage follower basically. So this is going to take current and it's going to go like this. All right. Now, on the other hand, if we go to the negative input, bringing this input pin negative turns off Q1 and now you're sort of dragging this base down which is turning on Q2. All right, so you're drawing current out this way which when this thing starts to conduct that's going to pull current this way so you get the opposite polarity right plus to minus minus to plus. So in the blue you can think of this as pushing current into the load the green you can think of pulling current out of the load and hence a common name for a Class B amplifier of this type is a push-pull amplifier. All right, so that's where that term comes from. Now this by itself is uh, far from ideal. The problem we have is that until the input signal rises above the base emitter uh, turn-on potential, we don't get any output at all. all right, so if we put in, let's say, a 1-volt peak signal, well, the first seven tenths, we're not going to see anything. It's only that last three tenths where this thing starts to conduct. So if you look at the output on this, all right, here's my um, desired output. Let's say this is one volt, plus and minus. So it doesn't turn on until you get up to, like I said, around three tenths, or excuse me, at seven tenths. So we only see these bits, right? So what does our output waveform look like? Well, the output waveform 
looks like this. We just get this piece and this piece, meaning it's off, we get the little hump, it's off, we get the little hump, and that's it. All right. Now, if the signal is a lot bigger than that, that discontinuity won't look quite so grotesque, and we might get something that looks like this, sort of rescaled, if you will. All right, so there's sort of like a little, a little notch in here. So we refer to this as notch distortion, very inventive name, right? Sometimes referred to as crossover distortion because it's the crossover from the positive to the negative. Or sometimes it's just called class B distortion because it's unique to a class B amplifier. This sort of splicing of the two waveforms together is, a, is an issue. All right, how do we get rid of that? Well, the obvious solution to this is to um, bias this up a little bit. In other words, don't have a dead short here. Put a couple resistors in. If I'm smart about it, I'll set up the DC voltage across those two resistors to be around 7 tenths of a volt, 6, 7 tenths of a volt. So that way these transistors are barely on, right? They're just sort of above the knee of the curve. So it won't take much of the positive signal before it turns on. Same thing for the negative signal. That will drastically reduce the amount of notch distortion. It won't literally go to zero, but um, it'll really, really reduce it. Now, people will sometimes, to, to distinguish between that sort of operation and this true class B, they'll sometimes call that class AB. You know, it's really just a cor corrected class B. You have this little trickle bias, so to speak, this idling. It's just like you know, a gasoline engine car. You don't, um, when you stop at a, a stoplight, you don't, uh, you know, the engine doesn't turn off completely. You know, it's, it's idling. It's running at a low, a low RPM. So it's the same kind of deal here. You have a little idle current, if you will, to prevent this sort of notch distortion, or at least mitigate it, reduce it considerably. The problem with using a couple of resistors is that the uh, thermal characteristics of the resistors, they don't match up with the, um, the base emitter junction of these transistors. Now this is a linear current voltage characteristic, and this is a logarithmic junction, so it's kind of a sensitive circuit. A better way to go about this is to get something in here that will match the characteristic of the base emitter junction. So typically what we would do is uh, use some kind of diode bias on this, and this is what we'll have. Again, my positive and negative power supplies. I'll just put a couple diodes in here. Now, these diodes, ideally, will have the same PN junction characteristic as the matching transistors. All right. I could throw my signal in here. Now, you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute. How is the signal going to come up through here? Because I've got this diode. Isn't that reverse biased? No, it's not because you actually have a DC bias current that's flowing down like this, which turns this um, diode on, both diodes on. So when we throw in the AC signal, all we see here is the dynamic resistance of this diode, which is very small. It's calculated the same way you would calculate our prime E, 26 millivolts over the diode current. So that's a very small resistance. Uh, we can improve that maybe by putting a little capacitor across these things to um, to reduce the AC impedance even further, so there isn't uh, an asymmetry, if you will. Um, but this matches up with the characteristic of the base emitter, so this is a much more stable approach. It's essentially um, sort of a variation on a current mirror, sort of a simplified version, a very simple version of a current mirror. So here's the basic current mirror. Here's our transistor resistor, put a diode in here. Um, notice from the base to the emitter, right, you've got a 0.7 here, you've got a 0.7 here. If the current that you program down here is a lot bigger than the base current, you can ignore it. So what will end up happening is this power source, and you know, whatever this differential is, all of that except for one diode drop drops across this resistor. 
that would set up whatever the current is. That current, ignoring the base current, flows through this diode and that produces a very specific voltage. In other words, if you think of your diode curve, right? So whatever that current is, that'll produce a very specific voltage. You know, let's say it's 0.663 volts, okay? Well, that same voltage is what's peering across the base emitter, and if the curves of these two devices are identical, then that 0.663 volts would produce the same exact current. So this current would mirror this current, right? This is a simplified version. We're not compensating for the fact that there is a base current, things like that. But essentially, if, if we did have a perfect match and everything was fine, then we could program what this um, uh, idle current is through the use of these resistors, right? So all of the power supply less the diode is what falls across this resistor. All of this power supply less the diode is what falls across this resistor. And as I said earlier, normally these bipolar power supplies would be symmetrical, plus and minus 25 volts, plus and minus 15 volts, and you know, whatever it happens to be. Okay, so that's what we would be uh, what we, we we would be looking at. Now we're going to attach a load to this, obviously, now maybe something like a loudspeaker, and of course we also want to have an input signal. Now the way this is configured, these DC voltages are both very close to ground. You know, ideally they would be perfectly ground. Um, this works out nice because in a, in a big power amplifier, you're going to get rid of a big output uh, coupling capacitor, right? That's large, it's expensive, it produces phase shift I might not want, okay? So that's a big plus, right? Huge plus. Now, the analysis of this turns out to be fairly straightforward. For the AC load line, this cutoff voltage is whatever the power supply is, right? Because after all, if it's symmetrical, this, is, this total supply is going to get split in half. We have this here, we're going to have that there. So, just as a quick number, right, if this was minus 15 volts and this was plus 15 volts, then our VCEQs would both be 15 volts, right? And that is the compliance on this thing. The peak compliance would be 15 volts peak. Again, just think back at your load line. You're going to go from the Q, which in this case is 15 volts, all the way back to saturation where the VCE is zero. So when you're under full current going this way, right, this thing, as it approaches zero, or as it approaches um, saturation, this voltage collapses at saturation. Maybe it's only a tenth of a volt. And essentially you're saying the full power supply sits across this load, plus to minus. On the other half of the cycle, same thing. The saturation potential collapses down to zero. Your emitter is nearly at minus 15 volts, and you have negative 15 volts across the load. And as, of course, we swing in between, we get some other potential between minus 15 and plus 15. All right? So the power uh, calculation is actually pretty straightforward, almost by inspection. You look at the circuit, how big are my power supplies? That immediately tells me what my compliance is. Right? Unlike the Class A, we had a little bit more work to do. This, we just kind of look at the power supplies and we're, we're sort of good to go, right? Then you can just say, well, you know, this is a follower, right? The signal um, is going out the emitter, so the voltage gain is virtually 1, non-inverting, okay? Um, there's my load, so I can just take my peak compliance, multiply it by 0 0.707 to get the RMS value, divide by my load resistor, you know, whatever that impedance happens to be, and I can find out my maximum load power, right? So my P load max will simply be my RMS compliance, okay? Squared divided by my load. And if you think in terms of, uh, like I said, a split power supply, the compliance RMS is just going to be uh, 1 to the square root of 2, 0 0.707, times your power supply. Right? You got that, you divide it out, boom, you got your maximum load power. One thing you see immediately in this case is the bigger the voltages are, the more power you get. Right? And it seems to kind of go sort of forever. Bigger voltage, bigger voltage, bigger voltage, 
you know, the bigger it gets. Um, the bigger the swing is, the bigger the power. So, you know, if I have an audio amplifier and it's going to produce, you know, 200 watts, 400 watts, 700 watts, you know, some crazy amount, we might be looking at really big voltages out here. You know, we might be looking at uh, 85 volt power supply, um, 150 volt power supply. Quite literally, the um, power supply that feeds this circuit might have a step up transformer rather than a step down transformer. In other words, 120 volts coming in from the wall in North America, and you might have more than 120 volts coming off the secondary of the transformer. Go figure, just because you need that big high voltage. All right. Now, last thing, since I've already talked about the gain and the load power, what about the input impedance on this thing? Right? How do I figure out the Zn? You know, what does my driving source see? Well, to a first approximation, we can ignore the the impedance of the diodes. So what we have are these two resistors, R1 and R2. Right? In the AC case, they wind up being in parallel. Remember, your power supplies go to an AC ground. All right. And then we see the basis of the two transistors. The thing to remember here is only one transistor is ever on at any given time. So you see one of the two Z in basis. Right. For positive signals, you're going to see the NPN. For negative signals, you're going to see the PNP. So what is that value? Well, basically, because this is a follower, Z in base is beta times whatever your load is. Again, we can treat the R prime E value as just a distortion mechanism. It's not going to be an appreciable value. So we can just kind of ignore that in these calculations and just say, OK, well, the Z in base is roughly equal to beta times my load. And that will tell you the input impedance that this source sees. All right? OK, so next time we'll run through an example with some numbers in it. There are a couple other things we want to look at. For example, you know, what's the power dissipation on these transistors? What about a voltage rating, you know, a breakdown voltage rating, a maximum current rating? Those are all things that we're interested in. And we'll look at those next time.